Carl Jung said the privilege of a lifetime is to become who you truly are. And Jung was not just a psychologist, he was a shaman, a visionary, a poet, an artist, a writer. The theory of the shadow self arose out of his psychoanalytic theory, specifically the concept that we have a conscious mind versus an unconscious or a subconscious mind. The shadow material is what the ego determines is undesirable or not useful. It then pushes these aspects of ourselves, of our psyche, of our personality, of our human nature into the dark where it remains undeveloped, it remains deprived. And because it is undeveloped, because it is deprived, because it is hidden away, it's caused to become cruel aspects of the psyche, which is then destructive to the self and destructive to others around us. These exiled parts of ourselves become a force that will act in opposition to our natural instincts, our natural instincts to seek out human connection, to seek out love, to seek good health, to seek joy, to seek fulfill fulfillment, to seek creative expression. Shadow work is the work to uncover that which we hide from ourselves. It is to delve in and to rescue those aspects of ourselves that are deprived, that are exiled, that are undernourished and then to nurture those aspects, to mother those aspects, to care for those aspects, to bring those aspects back to life and to integrate them into ourselves as a whole so that we can become more and more of who we are, more and more of what we are, and thus align with our path in life, align with our authenticity, align with our natural instincts to seek out joy, to seek out fulfillment, to seek out creative expression, to seek out love, to do the things that our soul, our psyche, ourselves really need in order to be happy and fulfilled and whole and joyful and to be present in the moment living life fully. There is no coming to consciousness without pain. Jung also said this. Let's break down what the ego is and what the ego does within this theory. The ego is the conscious mind and the identity. The superego is self-critical. It's self-policing. It reflects the social standards, the standards of those around us, the standards of the culture around us, the standards of our family, and the standards of those in our society that we feel are respectful. The soul self-ego is a term coined by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. She is author of Women Who Run With Wolves. And the soul self ego is the ego when it is fully integrated with our soul and with our higher selves. This is our goal through this work. Our goal is to become the soul self ego, the integrated ego, where our ego, our super ego, and our soul or our higher selves are aligned we will integrate, we will find ways to integrate through the work that we do. But first, there is no coming to consciousness without pain. We do have to witness our pain. We do have to unearth those aspects of ourselves that we have relegated to the shadows, to the darkness. We have to figure out why they're there, what purpose does it serve us in order to hide them away. And then we have to revive them. We have to revitalize them. We have to sprinkle them with the water of life and resurrect them. When someone is in exile, this is a form of neglect. This is starvation. This is malnourishment. What does it look like to have aspects of ourselves which are neglected, starving, and unloved? 
we can look to fairy tales and mythology to see these exiled aspects symbolized and embodied. The shadow world in symbolism, it looks like outcasts, like Lilith and Medusa, evil witches and hags. It looks like monsters, like Bluebeard. If you aren't familiar with the story of Bluebeard, he was a husband who killed all of his wives. And after a young maiden agreed to marry him, she was actually the youngest of seven sisters and all of the older sisters turned him down for marriage but because she was young and naive and she was eager to get out of the house and eager to rebel against her family eager to start her life as a woman she accepted him for those reasons not because of her feelings for him she went against her natural instincts and she married him and he was wealthy and everything that he had was open to her, was given to her. She had every opportunity possible. The only thing that she was not allowed to do was unlock the closet. She knew where the skeleton key was, but she was not allowed to unlock the closet. Of course, one day she got bored. He was often away on business which is why he was so successful, so wealthy. He was a very busy businessman. He, while he was gone, she decided to unlock the closet and there inside the closet, she found the dead bodies of all of his previous wives. So if you aren't familiar with Bluebeard, that's who he is. He is a monster in mythology. He's a monster in fairy tales. And that's one example of the shadow world symbolized. Another way that the shadow world is symbolized through fairy tales and mythology is with cruel figures like stepmothers and stepsisters, such as in Cinderella, the classic story of the mean stepmothers and stepsisters. The shadow world or the shadow self is also symbolized by predators like the big bad wolf. The shadow self is made from repressed things, such as things that we're ashamed of. It can be made from buried memories, skeletons in our closet, like in the story of Bluebeard. It can be made of unexpressed rage, anger that we have had no healthy outlet to express or that we have felt um, unsafe to express. Our shadow self can be made from unloved and forgotten aspects of ourselves. Those things that our ego has deemed as unacceptable aspects of ourselves. In other words, parts of ourselves that our ego, thinking that it's protecting us, believes that those parts of ourselves will prevent us from becoming successful humans in society. It will prevent us from becoming accepted by others or loved by others or successful in the way that society determines is successful. It can also be made out of unexpressed feelings, thoughts, needs, desires, and opinions. Those things that we have felt unsafe to express or those things that we have not had a safe place to express those things we have not had the courage to put into words or the know-how to put into the words or those feelings thoughts desires that we know others around us haven't been supportive us of we know that others around us will not accept those expressions of ourselves that is one aspect of our shadow self that is one aspect of what we can repress within our shadow selves what creates our shadow self it's created by conditioning familial conditioning cultural conditioning social conditioning it can also be created by learned patterns of survival or being in other words um Patterns of survival are defense mechanisms or their characteristics or habits or behaviors that we had to take on 
in order to survive a dangerous situation. And while that may have gotten us through that dangerous situation, there comes a time when we no longer need those patterns of survival or those defense mechanisms. And yet they're still there because we're not aware of them. They can be toxic or outdated modes of being, modes of being, behavioral modes or behavioral habits that we have learned from family members or that we've learned from witnessing unhealthy relationships or unhealthy dynamics between individuals. Things that we don't know that we've learned, that we have unconsciously or naturally absorbed within ourselves have become a part of the way that we live, we behave, we move through the world, but that are no longer serving us well and are in fact destructive or acting in direct opposition to our natural instincts. Our shadow self can be created by trauma, traumatic experiences, painful experiences, hurt that we have had to repress, that we've had to tamp down. Because perhaps at the time that we experienced it, we didn't know how to deal with it. Perhaps we weren't given proper tools or proper support to heal from this or to process these feelings or to understand these events. Or perhaps there's an aspect of our psyche that has decided that this memory is too difficult for us and that we're not allowed to think about it. We're not allowed to remember it. The reason that our psyche does that is because it's afraid that we can't handle it. It's afraid that we will be destroyed if we accept that trauma. Or it's afraid that those traumatic things that we've been through will make us undesirable to the outside world, will prevent us from being fully integrated people with the outside world. But the fact is repressing our trauma prevents us from being fully integrated people within ourselves. The shadow self is often created by defense mechanisms and self-protection. The things that our ego determines it needs to do to defend us and to protect us. In this work, we're going to delve deeper. We're going to delve into these concepts and we're going to delve into the ways that we can identify our shadow work, the clues that our psyche brings us regarding where our shadow self is, where our shadow material is, and we're going to learn specific techniques that are going to allow us to uncover that shadow material, nurture it, revive us, and become fully integrated people.